Having found his first dalliance with the Hollywood studio system a disheartening experience, Del Toro would finally make his during the final years of the Spanish Civil War, playing against a plot the fiendish Grand Keeper Giacchino and his plot to steal a secret cache of Republican gold, to be viewed by Del Toro as a masculine brother to its family and sister film Pad's Labyrinth. And you listen to Movies and Tea. Let's take this to the booth. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us again for another exciting edition of Movies and Tea, and probably more excitingly, the fact that we actually have a guest. It's not just myself and Kim for this episode, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show Vanna of uh, the Debatable Podcast, and you've probably also seen his work over at Action at Go Go. And first of all, welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you for obviously joining us on yet another of our projects, because obviously last time we recorded from Game Warp, and now we're uh, over here talking about movies uh, with us over here in the booth so uh welcome to the show uh, thank you so, so much I, i'm a little groupie so i'll go anywhere you guys go <laughs> if you guys want a board game podcast i'll be on that <laughs> don't, don't give us any ideas <laughs> got these great ideas about forming ideas but it's just like we're never too good at organizing the time to do them so it just seems right. to work on its own but obviously this season we're talking about Guillermo del toro um just obviously so we got sort of a grounding of your sort of fandom with the Del Toro universe. I mean, Greg, what uh, that you work you like to follow? Is he someone you sort of dip in and out of? Um, where do you sort of stand with his work? I love him. I, I think that, you know, of, of the living directors that we have, you know, he's one of the few, like, really idiosyncratic auteurs, like the people that we talk about, um, that, that have such a, a stamp on their films, um, and they're indelible. You know, the things that he's into, his idiosyncrasies are, are, are so, so del Toro. They're so, uh, um, noticeable from the bat. You only have to watch maybe a couple minutes of a movie to know that it's a Guillermo del Toro movie. Um, he's someone that I kind of, uh, came to probably through his commercial stuff, his Hellboys and his Blade Twos, and something that I kind of dug deeper into as a teenager. And, um, fantastic. I, I, I dig on everything that he brings. Those, those worlds that he, he builds is, is one thing. Um, but his, 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 you know, his his interest in clock mechanisms and um, the types of worlds that he's interested in, his, the characters that seem to constantly show up, um, those archetypes t- tend to uh, show up in his movies. Uh, every time, every time that he comes out with something, um, I'm at least very visually engaged. Um, and sometimes there are movies that take me, you know, a few uh, tries before I'm, I'm really into them. But um, Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, Crimson Peak, these are these are movies that I really, really enjoy um, across the board. And, and Del Toro, I've just been a fan of for, for such a long time. Okay. And obviously when it comes to Del Toro, which, where was your sort of starting point? Was it with those sort of commercial films like Hellboy, or did you... Yeah know about Kronos and that before. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Before I got into the Spanish stuff, it was is really that um, that kind of. I, I would probably say Hel- uh, um, not even before Hellboy, probably P- Blade Two, without even knowing Del Toro, kind of just being a fan of that series. And but Blade Two, when it came out, was really lambasted. A lot of people didn't like it. Um, my my group of friends and myself really enjoyed Blade Two, and that's that's really a gateway of seeing kind of um, him applying del toro isms to that series and and once you see you know a thread between that to hellboy that's um that's really noticeable and then i think from there uh i think right around that time um that pan's labyrinth came out and got a lot of acclaim um i think that was the the um in way the uh gateway to those spanish movies Movies. That's when I started watching those Spanish movies, and ever, ever since, the, the, that's it. That's the, the end of the story. I've been on Del Toro since then. I think we should also address, obviously, as the time of recording, we just now had the trailer for the new Hellboy that's come out. Um, mm-hmm. Am I alone in thinking it looks like garbage? <laughs> Doesn't look great. I, 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 I'd be, I'd be open to seeing where it goes with, but um, yeah, not necessarily uh, the first thing I would jump to. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. the The only thing that I'm interested in was because I really like 
uh, David Harbour from Stranger yeah. Things. So these, this is the only thing that's kind of motivating me, like, to want to see it. But then I'm like, ah, I don't know. I can spend my money on something better, I guess. I mean... Yeah, he's definitely a draw for me. I, I, lo- I love him, David Harbour. The time I'm watching it, I was like, oh, I'm excited about this part. And we would have, like, a fancy sequence or have, like, the bit with the trolls. And then they'd have a bit where, oh, wait a minute, it's set in London. And it's like, I don't really care about that. <laughs> or I'd see, like... Um, Gary Oldman's uh, sister as the as the bar owner, I think she is the uh, over here. She's been known for like her appearances in in soap operas, and uh, right. here she's sort of like just sort of like the gatekeeper of, uh, the, of where the bureau is currently hiding in this new world. And the whole makeup for effects of the Hellboy, he just he just looks um, uncomfortable. He does. He looks a little, a little uh, uh, constipated. You know, something's going on there. Yep. It's um, yeah. And I just the whole time I'm watching it, I'm just thinking, you know, if if they even if they just kept like Ron Perlman in it, I would have been. I think I've been more happy than I am now. And now it just feels like it, like a like the asylums just done their version of a Del Toro movie. When I look yeah. at it, so I don't. Know, maybe when it comes out, it it completely change our minds. But at the moment, I just. I can't say I'm excited for it. If right. if 2019 wasn't such a packed schedule, um, it may have more chance of seeing some money for myself. But right now, I just I wait till it filters through. But it's really kind of a sadness too. I think for longtime fans of of uh, Hellboy, especially you know, because you know Perlman and Del Toro, you know, they had a, a trilogy, they had you know a series in mind, and. To see that it didn't really come to fruition, that's kind of uh, a letdown for fans of them, too. Yeah. Well, we posted on the uh, Facebook the interview Ron Perlman gave earlier, the, earlier in the week, and uh, basically he was like saying that he tried so hard to get the trilogy finished with Del Toro, and that, as he put it, he poked the bear as much as he could, and it just didn't play yeah. out on this occasion. I think mm-hmm. he looks gen- felt, looked generally upset at the fact he wasn't able to finish out the trilogy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially because he keeps hinting at like Toro had planned, and mm-hmm. so when we look at what he built up over those two films, it really would have been—I think it would have been something special to see how it ended in yeah. his sort of uh, world. But maybe one day. Yep. I think if we win the lottery, maybe we can we can tell Dale Toro to finish his trilogy or something. So, <laughs> um, but on to tonight's. Film. We're obviously up to the devil's backbone in this re-evaluation of the Del Toro filmography. Uh, this film comes out four years after Mimic, so he goes comes back from the Hollywood system pretty disillusioned because Harvey Weinstein was basically being Harvey Weinstein and not letting Del Toro do his thing. He just basically kept messing around with the film. and It was really uh, Pedro Almavara, who had, was a big fan of of Bronos and basically said to Doto, you know, whatever you want to make, you just let me know and we will go and I will independently fund whatever vision you want to do. And that's what happened to be Devil's Backbone, which is the film we we're obviously discussing tonight. And as I said, it's very similar in many ways to Pan's Labyrinth and the mm-hmm. fact that here we are once again in the Spanish Civil War. And mm-hmm. we've got these two parallel stories. We've obviously got the war story going on and we've also got this ghost story uh, that is playing up at the same time. And as a sort of general film, I mean, Kim, this was your first time watching. Greg, have you seen this one before? Or... Yes. Yeah, yeah. So were you approaching it as, like, a, a fan? Or, I mean, where do you sort of stand on Devil's Baptist? And it was sort of, like, now coming back to it, as perhaps, like, a slightly older viewer. I sort of really dug this one, for whatever reason, yeah. so... Definitely. I think that it might have been the last uh, Spanish language movie of his that I had seen. I think I saw Pan's Labyrinth, then Kronos, and then uh, Devil's Backbone. And, you know, of those early movies, rather. And I think that, uh, yeah, I think it it was one of those movies, like I mentioned, that took a few uh, times for me to really uh, be on the wavelength of. First time I saw it, I liked parts of it, didn't dig the whole thing, and then second time I saw it, I was like, okay, I see what he was trying to do. And, you know, multiple times later now, you know, watching it um, cast tonight, I, I really dug it. I think I dug it 
the most that I ever have. Um, and I was just, you know, everything was firing on all cylinders story-wise. I was really into the narrative. Um, I really was into those characters and, and kind of seeing how the twists and turns occurred. Um, but yeah, the other thing is I hadn't seen it in a long time. I think that I saw this last when it came out on Criterion, which was when a few years ago probably more than that um so yeah i hadn't seen it since then and this time it was probably the the most fruitful okay and kim obviously it's the first time sort of watching this film what was your sort of initial impressions of devil's bad film it was great <laughs> i don't know it was great i mean i like you know i always like um i always like del toro's approach like i mean with Kronos and Mimic, we both saw, like, this kind of, like, those were also my first first time viewings, obviously, and they were, like, a different approach to kind of, like, a, a different, like, subgenre of horror, and this is the same thing, where it's kind of, like, a different take on, like, you start off right away, and you know right away, oh, what is, what is a, what is a ghost, right? right? And then he, and then that's kind of, like, the question, and he kind of, like, answers his question in that, in, in right away, in, like, the narrative of it, and you kind of go through this story, and I'm, out of all horror, I think that, like, paranormal, as in, like, ghosts and stuff, kind of ghosts and spirits kind of creep me out the most. So this kind of, like, really got under my skin at the same time, um, especially with those sequences and how it was used, even though, like, some parts are, you kind of, like, had a feeling, oh, well, maybe this inspired certain films to do things in a certain way, like later horror films that came out. Right. Um, yeah, so you really, like, I like the tone, I like the story. I thought it was, I thought it was really good. Were you turned off at all by the the like Kronos, um, as far as the the gore? Were you ever turned off by that, or did did I? It, I, you know, I don't have issue with gore. Um, so I wasn't turned off Kronos by the gore. Um, honestly, uh, I wasn't as impressed with Kronos as like uh, a lot of I guess as <laughs> as uh, Elwood is. Um, I mean, I think it was the pacing that I had issue with. Um, I thought that the movie felt uh, a tad slow, but maybe, like, if I watched it again, like, one, like, I feel like Del Toro, some some films, is, like, you need to re-watch to kind of, yep. like, see more, yep. and that's the same thing, like, I mean, I really love Pan's Labyrinth the first time I watched it, and a, when I watched it again, I noticed other things about it, and right. I feel that that goes for a lot of films um, in what he does, like, those little details and stuff, like, even in Devil's Backbone, there are a lot of details, and a lot of, like, uh, a lot of little things here and there that you can see. And, and it's those little details that really defines Del Toro as kind of like both visually as, and as like, because I guess it's because he's also like, he also writes his scripts and he gets involved in like multiple process in his films. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think when it comes to Del Toro, I mean, he's constantly, he's constantly evolving, uh, evolving the different genres. I mean, obviously we started off with vampires with Kronos. We moved on to his creature feature with um, Mimic and neither film was sort of following the traditional sort of tropes of the genre. And that's why I particularly like them because when it obviously comes to horror, I think vampire movies and ghost movies in particular are two of the least interesting of subgenres when it comes to horror. And it's surprising as well. The fact that both these films are of, of my favorites in his filmography now. When it actually comes to the actual ghost story aspect of this film, though, I did actually feel that it was probably one of the weaker sort of aspects of it, and that you could probably remove the ghost story element and just have it as the story of this orphanage uh, in this setting and just following these characters as they're basically trying to hide the fact that they're Republican supporters. Uh, you've obviously got the go plot there, and you can just, in just the journey these boys go interactions that we obviously um our lead boy has with like the doctor and the sort of head madam of this uh, orphanage just those sort of interactions are a lot more interesting than sort of the ghost element uh, that's at play here even though obviously it's kind of required for that sort of final uh that final act Right. I, I feel like it's it's in a weird way that this movie is the most grounded of uh, his movies, at least probably the, the early stuff. Um, you know, there's fantastical elements to all of his movies, but there's, um, you're right, there is like this real world um, connection 
that you don't see in all the other movies. In other movies, you know, there's there's something a, a little more hyper real. Here, it's almost like the the ghost story is um, is a portal. It's you know an, an extra, not not tacked on, but it's certainly not um, the the way in for most viewers. Most viewers are kind of connected to the orphanage story and the bullying and kind of um, the the many i think there's like three different kind of uh love triangles maybe two um happening here so there's a lot of like character emotional stuff um that really grounds it um compared to the more fantastical pan's labyrinth or even uh shape of water yeah, I, I agree with that. I was actually um, thinking about the, I like, when I was watching this, I really felt that Del Toro, you know, especially when you talk about, like, the uh, the two, I guess, the two love triangles, um, how he really, like, even in Mimic, I noticed it, and that's the fact that he really likes to have, like, different storylines going at the same time. It's kind of, like, different characters, relationships, setting yeah. up their own kind of, um, I guess, their own side of the story. And it's a different, and it's like a different situation. Like, you know, you have um, Jacinto, who's into the gold, but at the same time, he's connected to, like, the the principal. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, the principal has her own, like, kind of um, struggles. And then um, that's connected to, like, the doctor. And then the doctor is, like, kind of like the bridge to the kids in a certain way, where he's kind of, like, you know, always there. And then, and then you know, you have that. But I, I don't, like, I, I do agree that the ghost story is not so strong, I guess. But I really think that what really stands out for the ghost story is, like, um, it feels so secondary. But then I really like, like, the design of the ghost. Um, yeah. Where you see that, like, that blood flowing out of his head and stuff like yeah. that. And I really I thought that was really, that was really smart to do that. Because we usually see ghosts in such such a kind of oh, they're just like this waving kind of transparent object, you know, person that walks around or something like that. And this kind of like gives it a little bit more substance. Like there's a little bit more mystery. Well, why is that happening? And why is he designed that way? Right. And you have that kind of, you know, like you said, that blood trail from his head is is very telling. You know, I love that design. The fact that you kind of get a hint that this person was bludgeoned to death or, you know, hit his head or something. And I also love that, like, that ash that's around them. You see it, you see it around the doctor later. Sorry, no spoilers. Actually, it's a big spoiler. <laughs> but nonetheless, I mean, like, those kind of designs for those uh, ghosts, I mean, are, are just, uh, they're, they're fantastical and, and wonderful and, and unique. You don't see a lot of that. Um, usually what we're, like, uh, exposed to with ghost stories is you know <laughs> opacity you know that they're you know simply you can look through them you don't see this kind of grotesquerie and i mean that kind of like that kind of um hold over from their the way that they died in the same way it kind of reminded me of um what's that peter jackson movie uh with michael j fox oh, the frightness yeah, and, and and things like that, movies where you kind of see uh, how how you know these these demons or how these ghosts uh, died in their real life. I really enjoy that part of it. Yeah, and it uh, was ranked sixty one on Bravo Scariest Moments Ever uh, for the actual ghost sequences. There are some effective shocks throughout i wouldn't say this is probably the scary one of the scariest movies i've ever seen um but Tim, it's, uh... <laughs> i'm just i'm just sorry laughing because i i remembered last last night when i was watching this um i knew it was gonna happen and it's because they had built the atmosphere so much like typical del toro yeah and right. i i'm out of my seat and yelled and then my husband was like why do you do that i don't like watching movies with you <laughs> there's a there's a couple times that i feel like uh, Del Toro's been accused of not like feeding into to showing horror or like being a horror director so much as as creating that atmosphere kind of like w- with Crimson Peak everybody yeah. was, you know like like it was let down that that it was not a a scary horror movie and more kind of like a gothic ram- romance you know yeah, um, I mean, it's funny you should say that, because the most scariest person I've 
character I found in this one wasn't the actual ghost, but it was more Jacinto. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Just the fact he's like this unstoppable force. No matter what they do, he just seems to constantly keep coming back. <laughs> and he really sort of ties into this, one of the lesser used themes of Del Toro's work, and that's where you've got the um, the handsome brute, as I yeah. like to see. And obviously you see this again in Pan's Labyrinth with the Commandant, uh, or the stepfather character. Where you have these handsome guys, but they do some horrible, horrible things throughout the course of the film. And here he's, while he's obviously got it, got this whole plot, he's running to try and steal this gold that's uh, been hidden somewhere in the in the orphanage. And he's constantly uh, having sex with uh, Carmen to try and get the keys because she's got this big ring, like jailer's ring of keys. But he's not right. sure which one it is because they're all identical. So he keeps having sex with her and each time stealing, stealing the key and constantly going back and forth. And it plays this uh, sort of love triangle up with, between obviously the Doctor who has his own sort of feelings for Carmen. But it's hinted at that he's unable to perform uh, because of his age. So Carmen's sort of using um, Chiquinto for the... I'm here by, by Federico Lupi also uh, named as the greatest actor in the world, according to Del Toro. And uh, great to see him make a return, obviously, after he made that sort of starring role as the grandfather character in Kronos. And yeah. unfortunately, his English wasn't good enough for him to come across to Mimic, which we discussed on the last episode, Kim, and the fact that we really thought he could have like been, I felt that he could have played the priest character because that was a non-speaking role. But <laughs> sadly, it was not to be. <laughs> He is such a good actor. I would have loved to see him, you know, in in more things in these in these movies that he did with Del Toro. He's just so fantastic, and I would love to have seen them work together more if if it was um, if it was appropriate. If he could have, you know, done that and become an international star. But he is great in this. And getting back to with with Asinto, I feel like he's the he's lamentable he's a good he's a good bad guy for this because he is a bastard you know he's a real bastard he he's the bully of the bullies and um you know when it comes to uh revelations about whose death he was involved with and then when he finally does do some some killing i mean it really comes out um that you know there it's black and white that he is he is really the uh the antagonist and, and the real son of a bitch but you know like i said lamentable he you know you can tell that he's had some um some history with being an orphan being in the orphanage kind of forgotten being the lost one that uh that carmen re- uh, refers to um he never he was he always seemed to have been whenever they refer to him kind of you know uh, selfish self oriented and um you know when he's looking at those pictures of um his parents and him as a little baby and you know kind of talking about the what was the the um little poem he mentions like the lonely prince um that's him that's it's so lamentable i think he's kind of a tragic figure like most of the best bad guys um or bad women uh they always have a, a, a part of them that's that's really truly um uh, connectable to the the viewer it's really sad um the type of person that he is and he becomes this because of that you know because of that hurt okay um Kim, what did you think of uh the character chicanto i mean i mean does he do anything for you well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> obviously he does. Um, he He's really, like, I think that Del Toro is really great at designing his villains. Um, just like, you know, Greg is talking about. Like, I think that the best about it is that he really comes, he designs these, he creates these characters out of, like, human nature. And they're, they're like, human villains. They're, like, you would think that oh, the fantastical um, characters, you know, like, the ghosts or in the case of, like, vampire movies, it would be the vampire or... Well, not, but this one is like, the ghost is not, you know, your villain. He seems to be that way at first, you know, he seems like he's looking for something, something unresolved, like most ghosts that show up in movies. But obviously the story gets um, a lot deeper, and we realize that when we turn over and we look at this other story with um, Jacinto in the side, you really, like, see that he has so much darkness in him. Um, It is 
pretty tragic as character, but I think that a lot of his badness um, really, like, covers up that tragedy that he, he's gone yeah. through, I guess. Yeah. I felt he was this character just so corrupted by his, his own personal greed, his own lust to get hold of yeah. this gold. And really when he burns down the orphanage, it's sort of like that turning point for him, because it, it's sort of like he's crossed that line, and really from that point on, it's sort of like anyone who's sort of going to stand in his way or sort of follow his plans is going to go down and hold me. I mean, he kills his fiance. Right. Um, in a really surprisingly shocking scene, which I don't remember it being that as effective as I found it this time, where he basically just, just cold-bloodedly stabs her. And right. it's such a prolonged shot. And his whole character, I mean, it ties back again to this thing we see constantly within Del Toro's work, and it's a film that seemed film, uh, similarly explored by Tom Browning's work, and it's like, who are the real monsters? And it's here, it's, as Kim said, it's not really the ghost who's the monster. It's this handsome uh, caretaker, the Giacomo, who's the real monster of the piece, and the one that ultimately the boys uh, sort of team up Lord of the Fly style to t- take <laughs> out. Oh, man, when he gets that, uh, that, that uh, staff in length of lymph nodes under his arm, I always cringe. Like, that and the kid falling on his foot and, like, it, it going sideways, that and the staff going into the lymph nodes is grotesque to me. I cringe every time. Yeah, but, I mean, Del Toro's one of those directors who make fluid jars, so the jars where you've got the feces that have got, like, Spine Bifter, obviously the devil's backbone of the title. Um, right. that also apparently serves as an impotence cure, if we're to believe the doctor, because uh, yep. the limbo water, yep. he's, um, is just like really old rum that he's selling to the local villagers as this backwater sort of cure for many different ailments, which I thought was kind of, uh, unusual. And the fact that he drinks it himself. Yeah. It's a self-belief in his own cures. Yeah, it's any of them, but, like, that one of the major themes is kind of superstition versus reality, and that's part of the thing that kind of gives in to the ghost story is because we're we're so set in reality and, and kind of, uh, as the doctor says, you know, a man of science. So, you know, there's that ground there, but, you know, even he is the one that, that um, buys into superstition by drinking the, the rum, and, um, you know, of course there's a ghost that people are um, not sure sure about that they're uh they they don't believe some believe doesn't seem to be only one but the uh the uh, the orphans that believe it yeah it's and i mean again this is another of the delta or themes where the the extraordinary is mundane like the first time we see the ghost is just as a background character it's no sort of big fanfare it's just in the doorway and it, I just love the way that it's, it's obviously introduced like that. It's not like this big sort of setup like we would have from like a sort of traditional Hollywood system sort of director where they would just have this big sort of build up and then you'd have this big jump scare and um, instead we just have this uh, the shot of the ghost. It's just there, standing the doorway. It's kind of like in the uh, the descent where the creepers suddenly introduced. Right. And that's the thing with this this story. It's so unlike any other ghost story you see. The same way that Cronus is unlike any other vampire story you're going to see. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the reason I keep returning to Dotor's work time and time again. And certainly with with this story and with Pan's Labyrinth, the fact that he's able to run two parallel stories. So it's not just a ghost story. It's just, it's a what would you say was like a a thriller or a civil war yeah. story? Obviously, like got. It's a war story as well as a uh, fantasy sort of story. Yeah, the, or like a mystery and a war drama. Definitely. I mean, obviously we've talked a bit about Federico uh, Lupi, wonderful actor. Um, Marissa Heredes, I'm going to apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation of that surname, as Carmen. Um, I really liked her, her, uh, her, her, her performance here. It's just something about the way that she carries, she's sort of like, She's got this air of uh, elegance to her, even though the fact she's running this this orphanage out in the middle of the desert, uh, the Spanish countryside. So, yeah, I feel like uh, she is so um, 
graceful. At the same time, I feel like she's the type of um, character that uh, really is is a gateway too, because I feel like she's the the rock that the orphanage is based on. You know, she has these interests from from uh, uh, Jacinto and from the Doctor, so that there's that kind of um, the the main um, love triangle. But she is, you know, she's a um, a complicated character too you know she's having sex with uh Jacinto and probably against her better judgment so you know that's that's something that is kind of I remember the first time I saw this maybe kind of a shock you know kind of a shocking thing that uh she's kind of using him um and maybe not fully uh innocent for kind of his wrath um, towards the end. You know, she's she's kind of putting him in kind of uh, judging him and, and, and using him um, in a way that, uh, you know, you don't see that with, with someone that's running kind of a, a religious bent type um, orphanage. You know, something with, obviously, these are uh, uh, Catholics, people that believe in, uh, in uh, Christianity. And, and, you know, she's, she, she's kind complicated in that way and also in the fact that she's you know a supporter of the resistance yeah. um that's that's another thing that's kind of special about her but yeah she's she's great she's really she's really fantastic in this um so i mean obviously we're just talking about the relationship between Co and and carmen i mean that actual sort of sort of uh, relationship there kim i mean how did you find the character of Carmen herself? Because she is sort of one of the more complex characters here, because she seems to be playing seven different, several different people in, in various forms of relationships. And at the same time, she's a very sort of classy character in this very unique sort of setting. You'd think that she would... Yep. Yeah, I think that that's true. Um, I mean, I like Carmen. I think that she is really, um, she is really complex in the sense that um, there is this uh, part of me that really, I think there was something she said that really kind of like, kind of crafts the character that she is when she talks about like, um, when she's talking to Jacinto and she's talking about like her leg and she's like, oh, you know, like some, this, you know, it's an, I, I hate it, but it's a necessity sort of thing. And I think that kind of like uh, rounds out uh, the character that she is, you know, like yeah. she's pretty tough. She is. She's a tough old broad. That's what she is. Um, and I would, I've, she was one of those, those ones I wish I could have saved. I think if, if, if I can choose between the Doctor and her, I kind of wanted to save her, but I feel that at the same time, Del Toro's intentionally removed these adult guardians from, from, from the piece so that the boys are finally forced to sort of step up and sort of bond, bind together. Because they've spent yeah. this whole film, like, building these connections. We obviously, when... Uh, when Carlos first arrives at the orphanage, he's falls to foul of like the local bully, um, Jamie. Jamie is it? And yeah. um, we see the those two sort of slowly bond over the film. So by the time we're in the final sort of reel, the remaining boys have all sort of bond together to take on uh, uh, Jacinto. Right. And obviously, by having by removing those sort of adult guardians, it's sort of like they're being forced to step up and and enter adulthood and sort of defend themselves whereas before they've always got these adult guardians protecting be it as I said the Doctor or Carmen or even to a lesser extent um, Jacinto's fiance and uh, the the one who I assume was the cook who gets blown up. Yeah, Alma is that her name? I yeah. think that's her name um, who has one of the best deaths even even it's really <laughs> stupid Um <laughs> I have to question. I mean, what's up? She's going to put out the fire, man. <laughs> she's putting out a, a gasoline fire with a tea towel. <laughs> I'm just like watching. I was like, that's I'm not like, going to work. Doing? <laughs> but I mean, t- t- again, this is just leads into this weird bit of uh, the weird sort of thing. We have this whole, whole explosion and we see what appears to be Carmen and some of the other boys are blown out of the dining room. Yet when we come back to them in the aftermath, We've got people inside the dining room and they're sort of scattered around. It's like, how did you get inside when you were clearly blown out of the room? Right, um, right. That's something I didn't understand. I wasn't sure if I missed something or... 
I don't know if it's um, it's screwing around with geography because I watching it this time. I think that the boys were outside of that mm. um, that room. Whatever that room is that a, is that the kitchen? Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that they were outside when the when the doctor was surveying the uh, the damages, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it's kind of confusing about the geography. Yeah, I think that that was a little bit like I think I think if all three of us noticed it, then obviously there there, there must have been a little bit of a follow through issue. Um, yeah. yeah, no, the, it it was really weird because it felt like they had gotten almost everybody out except for like three or four boys or something like that. And it turned out that, you know, they lost the whole bunch of boys, you know, like that. And it was, it was kind of like, um, I feel like it was like created to create more devastation so that you would now have to zero in on just the normal, like the normal, I don't know what, four or five boys that we were focused on throughout the entire movie. Right. That little, that little click of guys. Yeah. I mean, Dead was very careful not to like kill anyone. We actually sort of, care about within that group it's just all the disposable kids that are, that disposable are kids okay i see where you're coming from it's <laughs> um i mean at least Toro has no problem with child deaths on it if this was like any other director you know these these kids would be like remarkably uh somehow safe like all the adult characters would be like blown up and, and whatnot that's fine but there always seems to be this real stigma if you have children being killed on that's 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 <laughs> something that's something actually poignant that you say because that's something that I really love about Del Toro is that he comes from the, that um, that time period. Uh, at least he was probably influenced by the time period of of putting kids in 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 danger and threat. Yeah. You know, there's a real threat there, and you see yeah. that in his movies, and that always registers better than the the kind of uh, Hollywood or Disney family type thing where you never put children in danger it seems like it seems like it's a it's like um it's a theme that's very frequent now in the recent years like you know you have other other directors that are up and coming kind of that do that also like child endangerment is this really (laughs) big thing now (laughs) and a lot of people like to do that um I mean, Del Toro, for sure. I mean, he does a lot of that. I mean, we see it in Kronos. Um, you know, uh, there's kids involved. And then yep. you see it in Mimic. You see it in this one. And you kind of... Yep. That trend keeps going on. Obviously, by the time we hit Pan's Labyrinth, it gets right. a little more intense. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Mimic, we have, again, one of the best deaths of that movie. We have the street urchins being probably killed by the bugs. Yeah. Uh, pretty early on in the film. I mean, obviously, uh, with us we've got their granddaughter who's constantly in in peril um and uh obviously and this one there's no denying these these kids haven't disappeared they're they're lying they're horribly horribly blown up um uh, there's right. no sort of denying what's happened to, the, to these disposable characters um and it's weird too because I mean you wouldn't expect because we've been talking about kind of the war being the background, but it is kind of an anti-war movie. You know, it's it's not just the setting. So you know, the war is happening in the background, but it comes home in in, in certain ways. You know, you have a bomb that's dropped on this orphanage. It doesn't go off, uh, luckily, but you know, there's there is uh, damages. Um, that come to them because of it. And, and that's one of those things, you know, seeing, uh, um, the, what Jacinto does to the orphanage and the, those type of ramifications, that's their own little, you know, war at home. And we see it again when the doctor goes into the nearby village and he sees one of his sort of co-conspirators being lined yeah. up against the wall and, and shot with these, these other soldiers. And, there's this whole subplot which doesn't ever really come to much where they feel that their role within within the war is obviously talked um, and they're giving out this information and nothing ever seems to come of it bar this one conversation between the Doctor and Carmen. And I felt kind of wish that it's more been sort of played up of it, but here Del Toro was clearly more focused on this gold plot and his ghost story than and keeping the war as this sort of background element, whereas when we look at Pan's Labyrinth, the war is very much at the forefront. It's this yeah. story that uh, we obviously see the attacks by the guerrilla soldiers, and um, the two sort of lead boys in, 
in in here, uh, Carlos and, and Jamie, they have cameos in Pan's Labyrinth as the Gorilla Soldiers. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, most of the fact that Del Toro keeps his, his trope of, uh, his sort of traveling uh, troupe of, of uh, actors. Yeah, I think that, that going back to, um, Devil's Backbone. I think that that's kind of a an empty thread, um, showing the the guys, the uh, conspirators getting killed. It really only serves the purpose to really push the Doctor and Carmen to want to get out of the orphanage, and then, it, you know, by that push Jacinto into where he where he's going into his violent uh, uh, events. Cool. Um, Kim, how did you find the the war thread here? I think that I think that I agree with Greg the most um, in the sense that I feel like the focus isn't really on the war. I feel like that was more of a backdrop, like the actual war going on. Whereas, like it's it's really I feel like it's really about like human nature and how like the war creates the situation where. Jacinto wants to get money so kind of he can leave and he can build his own life and that is kind of out of like bred out of like survival and that's kind of what causes a lot of this like it causes this whole situation to happen when they try to leave and then you know he becomes you know he becomes even bigger of a villain like he becomes this like really like I don't know this really bad guy I guess and Mm -hmm. I mean for lack of a better term um and it's really, like, you see, like, there's so much, you know, there, there's such a war going outside. And you think that everybody in this uh, orphanage would it would be more, you know, more united. And they're not. And I feel yeah. like it's because of that. You see, like, this kind of, like, this, I don't know, like, it's like a war within the war. And that kind of, kind of talks about the kind of, like, highlights how a war is created, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like a little battle within a battle, yeah. 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 The whole centerpiece with the, the diffuse bomb that sits in the middle of the court, courtyard, mm-hmm. I was really surprised that that didn't come into play more, and even now, yeah. we watching it after so long, I was sure that that bomb would come into play, and it never does. Yeah. And it really goes against the grain of, like, the Stephen King-style storytelling, where if we introduce the dynamite in scene one, you can guarantee by scene four that it's going to serve a purpose. And with Del Toro, he never, he never sort of uh, follows that. And perhaps it's just because I, I read the Wasp Factory and sort of saw that bomb, and it's like, someone's going to blow it up. <laughs> you I can't think... show me that and not do something with it. But, but, but you know, that's the thing is, I think that it's really clever of Del Toro to do that because it kind of creates this misdirection where like my mind kept thinking, Oh, well, what could have caused like, like it went to like this direct thing. Oh, well, you know, they were talking about how, um, Santi disappeared the day that the bomb happened. And then you see this thing and you're, you see like the the design of his blood and whatnot. And you think about, Oh, well, did did the bomb land on him? What Uh happened? Did something like that happen? And, you know, like, is there a connection? And then you, you keep connecting it back to this bomb who keeps who keeps showing up. And it's like they keep talking about it. And they're like, oh, you know, it feels like there's sounds. And then when he knocks on it in the beginning, there's like this sound that comes back. And then the Jamie is like, if you listen to it, you hear ticking. And it's kind of like it has this presence um, that looms over it. And I suppose there might be a deeper meaning to the reason of it being there. But I think that is so clever that it's there, but it's never, like, used, like, as in, like, it doesn't really blow up. But, you know, you kind of start the movie there, you end the movie there kind of thing. That's yeah. that's a good call. I never thought about it being the cause of um, Santi's death. That's a good call. It's it's another, it's like a, a, a one of a few red herrings that are in this movie. Uh, that's, that's a good call. Certainly the scene of the bomb dropping, when we obviously have the flashback to Santi's death and stuff, it's so visually stunning to see how that bomb lands. Yeah. And you see, like, the little ripples and the sound waves on the ground. And I was I was still not sure how we actually did it to actually create the sort of environmental effects that, of that bomb hitting the ground. Uh, whether he just had this, had this bomb properly dropped in front of this small child or whether there was uh, some post-production work that I, 
I'm not so uh, sure, sure, but I I took the. There's certainly, like, really subtle CGI in there, but then there's, like, what I would consider pretty egregious CGI, like the flames coming out when that <laughs> fire <laughs> happens. Yeah, it's, um... But, no, I, I don't feel... I, like you, Greg, I never actually assumed that, so thank you, Kim, for highlighting yeah. that fact, so... <laughs> Apparently I have a very dark mind. I don't know. <laughs> I felt like that was, like, the most... That was the most, like thing that are at, like right away clicked in my head and right. I don't know I mean I was like I was like oh what if what if this is like talking about how he's trapped under it or oh, you know this is happening cool. and then I was like going like really far with it and I was like oh no this is not it and then you know there was that question at one point where at the beginning where I was wondering if it he was really a ghost because at a certain part he felt like he was he felt like human right until a certain part, you know, obviously that, you know, he kind of just vanishes and you know he is a ghost. Right. That's yeah. a good call. I like it. Um, is there anything else that we wish to discuss about this we haven't discussed already? Um, I think in a weird way, so not like directly connected to this, um, but Del Toro is one of the few directors that has always done, like, film school in a box when it comes to DVD, you know, will put uh, making of uh, specials on there, commentaries, his journals. He really is interested in, in sharing and exposing the his filmmaking process to those that are interested, that you know, those that are students that want to be filmmakers. And I think that this is no different. I remember getting into these um, early Spanish movies and just having, at the very least, a commentary uh, from him he does the best commentaries but you know with hit these movies hitting uh, criterion they're just they're packed to the gills they're fantastic and i think that uh the criterion edition of this movie in fact is is one of my favorites um his commentary is great so that's definitely something that you should check out if you're if you're into this movie at all yeah i mean if it- this is a problem when it comes to special features and stuff. I'm always afraid that it's going to sort of, like, remove the the movie magic, so to speak. I don't mind, like, when they talk about the theory of the story and that, but when they start saying, oh, this is how we did this sequence, it's all like, I, I kind of don't want to see how you make the rabbit. We would rather, we would rather not know. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so I, I obviously appreciate the fact that he's, he's doing it. I love, like, design sketches and, and that, which obviously... The tour is pretty much well known for. I mean, he obviously comes from a visual background. Obviously, starting off in special effects, and his sketchbook has pretty much followed his work through. Um, especially when we move on to things such as like Hellboy, where he designed like all the mon version of America's Next Monster when they were doing Pacific Rim, and they basically just were designing different kaiju and uh, yeah. Jaeger suits, and they just had like hundreds of each, and they were just like having these conversations to decide which ones would actually make the final cut. And in many ways, that was the book I wanted to see, just of all the unused designs for both the the mecha and the, the monsters. And so when it comes to designing monsters, I think Del Toro is in, sort of in a class of his own. Yeah. Wait, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, I feel like, like now that we're looking at Del Toro and we've looked at, you know, some of his previous works and stuff like that, and I've, and, since, like, a few years ago till now, I've caught up to a, a few more of his work and stuff. I mean, I feel really sad that I missed out on, like, um, a few years. I think it was two years ago for Fantasia Film Festival. Del Toro was here giving a master class on, like, wow. um, monster creation. Wow. And that was, that that one went a long time. It, like, ate into the next film starting time, I remembered. And okay. I was in the next film starting time. And it just... Killed the schedule for that festival that day. Wait, wait, wait. So you weren't at the you weren't at the Del Toro thing, but you were in the next one, and you were getting pissed. Yeah, that it, was, it, it was a weekday. It was a weekday, so I had work, and I couldn't make I it a master class. But I, I was there for like the film that was afterwards. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm kind of like Romero in that respect. Romero's always 
he's so giving and so childlike. I love everything about him. He, he is just constantly, like, full of wonder, full of imagination. He, does, he doesn't He does seem to me like he's difficult to approach. I, he just seems like a real film fan, and that's the type of people that I, I like to hang out with. Yeah, definitely. I think this is the problem uh, with Andre. It's like, you never should really meet your heroes, because... If there's certain people where you just hear these absolute horror stories from me, it's all like, that kind of ruins the right. filmography for it. Um, and this is why I'm always so like hesitant about like going to these like Q and A's and meeting these people in uh, in real life. It sort of like loses some of the illusion there. But I think, I can see Del Toro having just having some interesting things to say. Just like just a Q and A with Del Toro, I think would be really interesting. Seeing where seeing how his mind ticks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, further viewing, um, where do you sort of go from here? If someone obviously likes Devil's Backbone, what do you sort of use as your companion piece for it? I, I feel like you would feel comfortable sticking with this, the Spanish language movies for this. Obviously, you would want to go on to, to Pan's Labyrinth, but, you know, don't don't uh, don't forget about Kronos. Give it a try. It might be your cup of tea. It might not. Um, but uh, I was trying to think. Uh, I really cannot think of, of something that um, brings the same level of, of kind of uniqueness and what Del Toro mixes in here other than a Del Toro movie. So I was trying to think of something that has, like, an otherworldly, fantastical feel but has some some real grounding and um and crimson peak is very close to i think it, it builds on it um but i think crimson peak has a lot of that it's it's a gothic romance there is an otherworldly fantastical element to it but um there there is grounding to to the characters and and it, it gives uh del toro some some space to kind of play with uh uh his idiosyncrasies uh you know like uh mechanisms and the type of things that he likes to do so um i think crimson peak is probably a, a good um run through um and also i had um Matt Zoller cites and Simon Abrams on Debatable talking about um, the book that they did for Devil's Backbone, and it's a coffee table book. Um, you can look it up on Amazon or any place that sells books. And um, you know, I haven't uh, read it myself. There, I've only seen uh, excerpts of it. But um, there's a lot of uh, great information, a lot of great uh, Del Toro interviews in there. I think there's one major interview that Sites did um, that throughout the book but um there's there's a trove of information in there if you're interested in in digging in here and um yeah definitely i would say uh crimson peak and if you're looking for further reading go with that cool um kim is there anything you would favor it greg took my choice (laughs) yeah mine was crimson peak also um mostly um for the reason that i think that I think that it's for the pairing that this is not like, you know, just like Crimson Peak and um, you know, Devil's Backbone wasn't wasn't a pure ghost story. It had something more to it. Yeah. And it really highlights, you know, that kind of uh, multi-layer story um, setup that Del Toro really excels at. And Crimson Peak does the same thing. Classic atmosphere. There are a lot of horror elements um, that really, really stand out. You know, there's something so much more than that, and I think that's why these two pair up really, really well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Um, okay, well, for my different track here, I've got a few uh, <laughs> ones with John Del Toro movies. Um, first one would be the uh, the Nicole Kidman movie from 2001. Yeah, I thought about that one, too. Yep. Um, and again, a fun little twist on the ghost story premise. Um, it's also a film which, more than likely, people will ruin the ending of when they tell you what it's about. So, uh, my son is Sixth Sense, which I was really enjoying until my brother came down and told me the ending three quarters of the way through. So, thanks for that, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a different sort of tract, but I would say City of Lost Children. It's got a very similar, similar sort of theme, and Jeanette and Cara's work is very similar in many ways to Del Toro, even though it does lean to the more fantastical side. They create sort of grown-up fairy tales, and... 
their whole filmography is really great, but I think certainly, certainly Lost Children, if you like Bill's Backbone, is a good one to move on to next. Um, and finally, I would say to go with um, Suspiria, which um, isn't ghosts, it's instead witches, but is got a really nice sort of mystery to it, and um, I think it would... It would pair nicely as a double feature. You can either watch the original um, or you can watch the recent remake, which I've heard very mixed results about, but obviously it is in cinema, so a little easier to get hold of. And uh, it does obviously feature the wonderful Tilda Swindon. Uh, so the choice is obviously uh, they're yours. But obviously uh, let us know what you thought of Devil's Backbone, whether you like it or not, uh, where you sort of rate it in the Del Toro Filmography, and uh, you can obviously follow us and let us know if on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can also check out our blog, uh, where you also have the full uh, full back catalogue of episodes, including our season one of, of uh, our first season, where we obviously talked about Paul W.S. Anderson and uh, delved a little deeper than the Resident Evil movies. And uh, if you're listening to us on Podomatic or iTunes or Spotify, wherever you happen to be leaving to us, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons, because it all helps get us noticed. Maybe leave us a nice review or some comments. Um, it definitely helps us get us more noticed. Um, but this obviously brings us to the end. I would love to obviously thank our special guest, Greg, for joining us for this episode. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you, of course, to my wonderful co-host, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but until next time, thank you for listening.